uh, plastics pollute in two main ways. Uh, first, physically, through literally being pieces of plastic somewhere, the physical parts, and then also chemically. There are plastics in every single ocean in the world, including the Arctic. This is where I now do research, up in the Arctic. Uh, Arctic provinces in northern Canada. Um, and they, about half of all plastics sink and the other half float. Almost all research done in the world about plastics are about floating or used on plastics because of the expenses of uh, submerged plastics. Uh, these are plastics under the Arctic. And there's an amazing video uh, that isn't actually uh, public, but uh, there's a sign, when the Arctic uh, ice flow in the north, the Northwest Passage first broke open because of climate change, all these scientists got excited about putting their submersibles under there. And there's this, this moment where this scientist is like, we are going to see things we have never seen before. Look, what is that ahead? It looks like a jellyfish. Oh, it says, have a nice day. <laughs> and it was a plastic bag from a convenience store. All right, so there are plastics literally everywhere, everywhere uh, right now in different concentrations. They tend to accumulate in gyres, right? This being the most famous of the gyres where the trash vortex is or the garbage patch, if you've heard it, it's the most studied area. Uh, but there are five oceans in the world, five gyres, and plastics tend to collect there. There are currents, very large currents, and the middle of those currents are driven by uh, water that cools, and as it cools, it sinks. Everything left in that water late stays floating at the top, and so they're fairly uh, stable areas of accumulation and where a lot of studies happen. So, but the thing is, if you are in the North Atlantic, in the middle of the gyre, and you look over your boat, this is what you see. Right? There is no floating island. That was a metaphor that raged out of control uh, in the early thousands. Um, most plastics, the vast majority of plastics, are microplastics, uh, less than five millimeters in size. Right? So this is from the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are totally rife with plastics. Uh, this is from one of my research uh, sites in um, the middle of nowhere in uh, Newfoundland, uh, off the coast of Labrador. Uh, and you can see, especially here, there are nylon strips from fishing nets, because there's a lot of fishing that happens there, as well as other forms of plastic. Uh, and this is what most ocean plastics look like. Um, the problems... Right, uh, so that most plastics are these teeny tiny... Most uh, ocean plastics are these teeny teeny tiny things that fragment off of larger plastics. Um, and the reason they do that is these long strips are polymers, right? The plastic part. But if you want your plastic to be UV resistant or purple or uh, more flexible, you add plasticizers into it, chemicals. And those chemicals aren't chemically bonded. Otherwise, if they were chemically bonded, your <coughs> polymers wouldn't be polymers. They would be something else, right? The most famous of these little guys is BPA, bisphenol A, right? The reason that BPA PCBs, flame retardants, etc., migrate out of plastic so easily is that they're not chemically bonded. <coughs> and as these little beets migrate out, the plastic gets very brittle and breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. Right? So that's how they fragment. These little pieces are still 100% plastic. They're so small that they can be eaten by plankton. They're so small that they, these little, the red little dots, and the black little dots, and the yellow little dots, and the blue little dots, those are all plastics, right? And so these are even smaller than the, than the previous slide. These are little, little uh, flagella for different uh, plankton animals. Um, there's been tiny plastics found in the blood of mussels, right? Uh, so they're pretty ubiquitous, and they're very well integrated into different ecosystems and different bodies. Large plastics uh, pose different pl uh, problems than microplastics. So ghost fishing or entanglement is probably one of the most famous problems that ocean plastics present. Uh, so uh, people, when, when uh, fishing nets go rogue, uh, they continue to fish. Um, that pictures of seals with you know, milk things around their necks. Um, but hitchhikers is another problem that's underreported. Um, squid fisheries in the middle of the Atlantic started pulling out tropical fish in their nets in the middle of nowhere because they hitch rides in bays and then entire ecosystems live around these plastics. This is coral, right? So there's even endangered ecosystems that live around these plastics and float around. The thing is, sometimes these plastics end up on a shore and introduce invasive species, right? The Japan tsunami plastics were the big scare recently about invasive species. But the bigger problem is chemical. So this is the other way that plastics pollute. If you've ever had spaghetti and you put it in Tupperware and then you're trying to scrub the orange out the next day and it just won't come out, Right? Plastics glom on to oily chemicals, hydrophobic chemicals, very, very hard. Um, and they can absorb, absorb up to a million times more oily chemicals than the surrounding water. So that's, a very, that's an extraordinarily high uh, load. 
So you have, if they're, like, plastics start on land, and they go out into the ocean, so they're going through bays and etc., and on the way, they're collecting all these sort of plastics. You can see the direction of the arrows, right? They're picking up, some of them are heavy metals, things like lead, um, but they're also, once an animal eats it, it's now a warm, uh, acidic, abrasive environment, and that's when the plastics leach out again. And that includes not only things that's picked up, but also things that were in the plastics to begin with, like BPA. Right? So um, these are one of the major problems with ocean plastics and the way it actually affects uh, animals. Uh, most plastics release, it's call, uh, they're called endocrine disruptors. All of these chemicals, except for some of the heavy metals, act like hormones. Right? So when you ingest them, they don't kill everybody. They mutate everybody. So the way that hormones work, uh, they lay down some of your genetic material, uh, they lay, they, they're at work in everything, right? So uh, these chemicals have been linked with everything from early onset puberty to increased obesity to male infertility uh, to heart problems. A lot of the different health epi epidemics facing uh, both wildlife and humans have been linked back to endocrine disruptors right now. Uh, two days ago, they were just linked with early onset menopause as well. Now the thing with uh, this is a, a community in the Northwest Territories. Uh, these chemicals not only accumulate in the body of a fish, they also bi biomagnify up the food chain. And uh, aquatic food chains are much, much longer than terrestrial food chains, so they, they um, accumulate more than an, an average terrestrial cow-based or something like that um, food chain. And the people, the most c contaminated living things on the planet are polar bears and uh, northern indigenous populations with traditional diets people who eat polar bears, and seals, and whales, and stuff like this regularly. And in fact, these folks, these are Greenland natives, are so, uh, when they die, their bodies can be classified as toxic waste. They're carrying such an incredible load, right? Same with polar bears. If you find a polar bear, on the res when I do research, if you find a dead polar bear, you have to use hazardous waste protocols to transport it, because they're so contaminated. You're not allowed just to touch it or anything like that. So, another problem with plastics is that they last a very, very, very long time. This includes the chemicals. So something like DDT, which is the same kind of chemical that, that leaches out of plastics, it was banned in Sweden in 1975. It's still found in breast milk today in Sweden. Right? So these chemicals last into perpetuity. They're going to last longer than the human species, not because we're all doomed and destined to die, but because species time is much, much, even the dinosaurs, which were all the species that lasted the longest on this planet, plastics are going to last longer and plastic chemicals are going to last longer. So this, these, if you've seen something like this, being like, oh, plastic bottles, there's a finite amount of time. They have a half-life of 100,000 years. Um, that, so no plastics have been around for 100,000 years, clearly. So the way this number is gathered is that uh, scientists put pieces of plastic in a, in a jar, well, in an environment where they're likely to, to, to degrade. And so it's a vibrating, like, a, you know those paint vibrators that you have in the store? It's this thing that vibrates this glass jar of plastic, and it's fure, full of uric acid. P, basically, and they shine a very bright UV light on it. And then they measure how weak the bonds get, and then mathematically they determine how long and hard and bright you'd have to have that environment for those to break apart. And that's what they get. The thing is, most plastic don't hang out in brightly lit, vibrating jars of P. Right? Very few of them do that. And so this number is very conservative. And also in the ocean and landfills where it's dark and cold, they're going to last forever. Right? They're just, nothing's going to happen to them. And they're not all post-consumer plastics, right? These little guys that are circled, those are called nurdles. Um, I have some in my pockets, my jacket pocket, if you want to look at them. Um, they are pre-production pellets. So if you want to build a beach ball or a toothbrush or some plastic beads, you're going to need a whole bunch of these that come to you in a container ship. So the problem with cleaning up is it's anachronistic. It's a, it's a type of pollution intervention that's based historically in the 20th century on sewage, mostly. You cannot clean up ocean plastics, first of all, because it's so... Oh, there's my... This is, this is, this is the dump. Uh, or the landfill, pardon me, in uh, St. John's. Right? So cleaning up, you'd have to get the plankton out of the belly, or the, the plastic out of the belly of the planktons. You'd have to kill massive amounts of ecosystems to get the plastic out of those ecosystems. And those are the ecosystems you're trying to save, so you've got that problem. Second of all, the ocean is the biggest thing in the world. There's a lot of water. Um, also, a bunch of it sunk, you can't get it all. But also, once you get it out of the ocean, where are you going to put it? Daddy. You're going to put it in the landfill. That plastic, where they're going to last forever. 10,000, 100,000 years in the future, those landfills are going to be underwater, or they're going to erode, and the plastic will end up back in the ocean. Right? So, cleanup is just the deferment in time and space. 
of these chemicals to other and these things to other places. Right, so everything from, be and beach cleanups are fine because they move, like they def deference helps for a bit, but it's not the solution to ocean plastics. Uh, recycling, um, only 9% of plastics last year were recovered in the United States. Uh, places like Germany, which have the highest recycling rates in the world, rock out at about 80%. The main problem with recycling, if you've read this book, this is an amazing book about, this is the best book about recycling by Samantha McBride. Uh, she used to work for the Department of Sanitation here in New York City. So plastic isn't recycled as easily as something like aluminum, for example. There are like a million types of plastic. I know it says six on the bot on the things, although six is other. Or is it now seven? Seven, we're up to seven. Seven is other. But the thing is, each of those, like PET, uh, as a plastic, can have any number of uh, plasticizers in them. It can have any, it can, if it's extruded versus if it's molded, has different uh, melting temperatures. And so they're actually two thirds of the 9% of plastics that are gathered are buried or burned because they're just not viable as feedstock. The other thing is that um, oil is subsidized. Plastic uh, stock from recycling, gathered from recycling, isn't. So it's actually cheaper to go frack, crack that frack, put it in a cracking tower, um, and then make nurdles, which you know what the melting temperature is because you know exactly what went into it, than um, recycled plastic. So it's not viable for a whole bunch of different reasons. So solutions. You gotta change business as usual, clearly. Most of the ocean plastics are disposables, right? Disposable packaging. Disposable packaging is brand new. It only really started happening in the 20s and 30s. Um, and I've written about um, how industry had to teach people how to dispose of things, right? This is during the Depression, right? Just after the Depression and, and after. People, were, people would riot when there were disposable cups in railway stations instead of the communal tin cup, right? Because it was so wasteful and they refused to do it. People would not throw away their tan packs. People would not throw away their tampons and their pads when they first introduced disposable sanitary napkins. They would wash them and reuse them. People had to be trained to waste, right? There was no social license for it. Now there's social license for it, even if you don't like it. There's almost no way to get your food without it being in packaging, right? So that's an area. And, and, this is, and if you look at almost any ocean plastic, this is it. And then um, from some fishing um, is pretty much the two major sources of ocean plastics right now. A second uh, place to press is policy and the precautionary principle, right? The idea that if you don't know if something's going to harm, uh, you don't have to prove that it's not going to harm. The person who wants it has to prove that it won't harm. Nope, I said that wrong. Read this, that's what I mean. Um, if you don't know if it's going to harm, you don't have to prove that it will harm. The person who wants it, industry, has to prove that it won't harm, which is very hard. Proving not harm is a very high standard. Um, the United States had this in the 20s. And the EPA, what predated the EPA, had this in the 20s. It's no longer in fashion because of uh, industry-friendly governments. Um, Europe kind of has this in reach legislation. It's much closer. Right, so introducing this again. Under this, plastics would never have gone to market the way they went to market. BPA, et cetera, would never be on the market the way that it is right now. So scientists are actually some of the most radical uh, people thinking about ways to deal with the plastic pollution, more than, more than some of the plastic pollution NGOs and advocacy and environmental groups. Um, and I can talk more about that in the q and if you want to. Uh, this is a group, Chelsea Rochman is actually still a PhD student. She is amazing. Uh, she's putting her career on the line as an activist scientist, which is awesome um, and super dangerous. Uh, so they said you have to classify plast uh, plastic waste as hazardous because it actually is, under even if you don't have uh, really robust reg legislation, the legislation that already exists right now about what hazardous waste is, what kind of chemicals are in it, uh, the tox type of toxicity of those chemicals and the amount, plastics in the ocean actually already have those because of this glomming sort of situation, right? They are actually, they fall under hazardous waste. Right, so just put it in the program. And the, the, this is an economic intervention, actually, because the reason that plastic disposables were so popular following the 1920s and 30s is that industry gets to externalize its costs. It doesn't have to pay for picking up that waste afterwards. Municipalities deal with that, or in the global south, no one does. Right, so they can just externalize it onto other systems. Um, and that's very profitable. But if that waste is then classified as hazardous, it's no longer profitable because the, the protocols for dealing with hazardous waste are incredibly expensive. For collecting it, for shipping it, for storing it, it's, you can no longer externalize those. So this is, an economic, this is primarily an economic intervention. So are the last two that I just talked about. So in my opinion, my expert opinion, almost all 
significant interventions have to happen at the economic level, where profit is no longer the primary uh, decision-making rubric for what gets made, how it gets transported, etc. who's accountable. Um, and then there's some people who advocate for things like green chemistry, that you teach the scientists uh, that if it lasts forever, if it bioaccumulates or biomagnifies, etc., you don't make it. Back to the bench. Right? There are a few schools who are doing this, but you'd have to have an entire uh, world doing this. Um, and the way you would get an entire world to do this is to actually make the precautionary principle viable. <coughs> Right, as opposed to one person making, if one person, if I, ref, if I make BPA but you don't, there's still BPA, right, so. All right, so basically, a lot of the, the solutions out there for plastic pollution right now are technical. They're technical solutions to a systemic problem. You cannot solve a systemic problem with a technological fix, right? I think that's sort of intuitive for this crowd. Um, so you have to actually push on the systems as opposed to the object of plastic uh, at this point. Thank you very much. Right, right, right.